All right. So you guys asked for it. You put it in messages. You put it in comments. And I did a poll. And you guys said you wanted to see more from Kelly Kukul. And you also wanted to see his or her rebuttal to how the pendant could actually go into the neck based on the forces and things required to make that happen. So let's get into it. I will warn you up front. This gets pretty scientific. So again here, we have Kelly Kukul. Neck wound severity. As we discussed earlier, the bullet damaged the cervical vein, not an artery, based on the color of the blood. The way it flowed out instead of squirting and further supported by only a little bit of blood left at the scene. Specifically, most likely the internal jugular vein or the IJV. There are actually more jugular veins than that. They're part of an interconnected system working together as a whole. So Kelly Kugel is saying most likely it was this large internal jugular vein. A quote, all IJV injuries should be repaired, but may be ligated if hemodynamically unstable, meaning it should be attempted to repair a cut internal jugular vein, but it's also common to just ligate or tie it up if the repair is impossible, which tells us about the high tolerance of the body in regard to this venous network. So he or she is basically saying if one of these veins in here gets hit, most likely they will seal it off because there's plenty of other networks to carry the blood around. A quote from an article on neck injuries in which there are two cases of internal jugular vein damage. Both venous injuries were ligated at the follow-up, 12 and 21 days. Both patients were doing well with no complications. The main risk is the immediate bleeding before managing to stop it and the risk of the vein sucking in the air. While still dangerous if unattended, it is far less dangerous than a cut artery. So in other words, if you were to have an artery get slashed in your throat, it's much more dangerous than if you got a vein slashed in your throat. So I will say, based on those videos, there does seem to be a lot of blood that comes out initially, that initial spurt. Charlie's wound was attended to within seconds by his trained security staff, which is as close to immediate help as it gets. Charlie's wound was definitely serious, but it most likely wasn't him being dead before he touched the ground, as some suggested, at least not because of the bleeding. So it could still be because of, you know, if his vertebrae got hit directly by the bullet or something similar. Calicucle is saying that the bleeding alone doesn't seem to be the main cause of death. There was, of course, the decorticate posturing, which indicates severe brain damage. It occurs for a specific combination of some parts of the brain and motor pathways damaged and still others functional. As I proposed, that might have happened by the bullet hitting the occipital bone, the back of the head, causing the trauma underneath it, and then traveling along the spine. That was severe, but might not have been immediately fatal either, as statistically, there is a 37% survival rate connecting to this posturing. A quote, Following a head injury, only 37% of patients displaying decorticate posture and 10% of those displaying disturberate posture will survive. Kalakuko is saying the overall point is that his condition was severe, but I think there potentially could have been some chance of him surviving. Many seem to say there wasn't. So here Kalakuko is basically saying that based on their investigation so far, it seems like the injuries that he got, even with the decorticate posture and that kind of stuff, could have theoretically been survivable about 35% survival rate or something like that based on literature. So some people are saying that Charlie's still alive, that this was all staged and everything else, but there is a very, very small chance, and again, this is just theories, that he could still possibly be alive, but not well. All right, now here, Kelly Kugel talks about the potential bullet that's cut on video. Now, this is something that, if you look on my channel, there's an interview with Jason Goodman, and he talks about the compression and the different things that can happen that makes it so that the the way the bullets appear are out of order based on certain compression settings and the way that um, video compression and codecs handle everything. And this is Kelly Kukul kind of speaking to that a little bit. The potential bullet cut on video. Kelly Kukul is talking about these previous images that Jason Goodman had put together. Mr. Goodman presented his theory that the bullet was cut on video. He merged parts of the images from a 20 FPS and a 30 FPS versions of the same footage to get three dots in an almost perfect line right around the moment Charlie's been shot. Although it happens to coincide with one of the very possible trajectories, I have to say I think it might not be the bullet that hit Charlie. One frame before the middle dot appears, I only have the 20 FPS version with two of the dots. The middle dot appears, still no effect on Charlie. You can see that here. The dot moves to the upper right. You see it up here. And this again was in the last video that I showed. Another viewer had sent in some video and it had basically seen the same thing, right? So Charlie's shirt's going up. Uh, it appears that maybe he's been hit here, or that's his mic. I can't, I can't really tell from this angle, um, but there's something going on here, but there's also what appears to be a projectile or bullet up here. Kelly Kukul and some other people theorize that the bullet that Jason Goodman is seeing is not the one that hit him. It's just one that's flying by, which would go back to the multiple shooters from different positions theory. 
Kalakuko says, the dot is quite slow for a bullet. Let's say the distance from Charlie to the edge of the tent is 12 feet. That the right dot is near the edge of the tent, and the left dot is right at his head. That means distance between every two of the dots could be six feet. And I believe that Jason Goodman said about five feet, if I remember correctly. The 20 FPS video means a snapshot every 50 milliseconds. That means the dot moves 120 feet per second. A typical rifle bullet speeds are 2300 to 3500. Low velocity PCP air guns seem to start around 300. The bullet appears to move away from Charlie, which is what a lot of people are saying. And that's what Jason Goodman was kind of um, tr trying to correct with his merged image and the compression and codec issues is that it was going towards Charlie, not away from him. Mr. Goodman says that this can be caused by technical reasons of video mixing up the order of some portions of the image when encoding, suggesting the dots actually went towards Charlie. Although I must admit, I haven't observed such phenomenon in compressed videos with similar small flying objects, like for instance, a bug jumping around instead of flying in a straight line. Let's assume it is possible, but I would say uncommon. It would also be good to see at which point the video of the left dot appeared rather than a merged still image. The dots aren't in a straight line. Mr. Goodman says it was difficult to align the two versions of the video. I'm not certain in which ways it would be difficult to align two versions of the very same video, even if one video is cropped in differently. It seems like a matter of stopping both videos at the same anchoring moment and then shifting one video on top of the other until the scene overlaps perfectly. In no way do I aim to somehow debunk Mr. Goodman's theory. I'm glad he's doing his investigation. However, it seems uncertain whether the dots are the bullet. One of the things we could use is a clear 3D model of the scene, and all possible trajectories of the three dots could form within it, as it is a bit ambiguous where the dots are actually within the environment. So like you can see here, the necklace is, is already off, and you can see this object here. So if the bullet came from the back, or the projectile came from the back, he wouldn't already be reacting and his chain wouldn't be flying off. So again, does this mean that there were possibly two shooters or more than two shooters and one missed and you see that bullet flying past and another one hit him at the same time? I think it'd be pretty rare. It'd have to be very synchronized to be able to hit Charlie Kirk and in the same frame catch a bullet flying past. At the speed the bullets move, that'd be pretty rare. So... This seems to be a very extremely coordinated operation if it was more than one person or maybe a synchronized set of uh, mechanical guns, maybe like in a camera or even just regular guns that are, have synchronized triggers. I don't know. I don't, I don't know much about that technology. But as you can see here, it's very strange that he's already been hit here, chain's already flying off, and there's this little projectile right here. There was no exit wound behind him anyway. And if this was coming in from the back then that means there's more than one shot coming from the back. Again, this is very strange, and these images seem to cause more questions than answers. Kelly Kukul says, Still the coincidence with the time of the shooting is striking. I can imagine the dots being relevant even if it's not the bullet, perhaps some fragment of something. The direction of the dots seemed to match the direction of the necklace whipped back right after the dot flew that way. Interestingly enough, though, the middle dot, the first one in my 20 FPS video, appears before any effect was apparent on Charlie not even the bulging shirt in the back. And then I asked Callie Kukul, I said, Valhalla VFT and some other people have kind of reviewed this pendant theory that I've put out there from Callie Kukul. You know, they were kind of saying like a lot of it possibly made sense. Some of the, the, the dynamics and the ballistics made sense. But the one part they couldn't get behind is the fact that the pendant would actually go up into the neck. So basically saying that it wasn't theoretically possible based on what they'd seen. Now, these are people that have seen wartime. These are people that are very experienced in ballistics and the dynamics of guns and those type of things. So um, I can't argue with them personally because I haven't been in those situations. But Kelly Kukul basically is given his or her rendition of how this could theoretically be possible. They go on to say the calculation will definitely involve estimating cavitation size and duration. I've also seen some YouTubers misunderstanding and thinking that the expanding chest was supposed to whip up the pendant, which is not the case at all. I don't even think the chest expanded from any commentation, just the neck. Interesting. All right, now I think some of this is going to get into some nerdy math. Regarding the pendant's ability to gain sufficient speed and penetrate the neck, mathematically describing a pendant accelerated by the expanding circle turns out to be quite difficult. I tried my best. The main point is there are two accelerating factors. One is the expanding circle. It has increasingly greater effect as the necklace gets more in contact with the circle. 
And then there's the whipping effect. Due to the law of conservation of momentum, just by the portion of the free necklace out of contact with the circle decreasing, the speed of the remaining out of contact portion increases. The two effects combine. The whipping effect multiplies the speed received by the pendant through the necklace from the expanding circle. So if you combine the whipping effect of the chain going around the body from the initial impact, as well as the expansion from the cavitation, both of those forces increase the amount of power that could project that pendant into the neck. And that's kind of similar to if you see, if you have a car and it hits something at 60 miles per hour, you have a certain amount of damage. But if you have two cars coming towards each other at 60 miles an hour, that's a 120 mile per hour collision. And then they quote this resource, the minimum velocity required to penetrate the skin is about 40 to 50 meters per second. All right, so let's check out this link. So it goes to bhu.ac.in, which is Banaras Hindu University. And if we look at that link, terminal ballistics. As we go through here, talking about concepts of wound ballistics, target site, it's saying the minimum velocity required to penetrate the skin is about 40 to 50 meters per second. This is known as threshold velocity. Its value for bone penetration is about 60 meters per second. Wounding effect of a projectile would depend upon several things. The target site, whether it's in front of the back of the body, uh, the neck. So one thing to think about here and consider is that as the neck is expanding from cavitation, the walls of the neck are getting much thinner. So I would think this 40 to 50 meters per second probably goes down quite a bit with that kind of pressure, especially with it going towards it. Also the velocity of the projectile, the constructional features, and then the range of firing. So how close or far that person was. This also depends on the shape of the object. The cross was pretty pointy and hung by his top arm, so it is bound to travel with the top point first. So as you can see here, we have the chain, and then this would be the cross or the pendant. They're basically saying here that it's most likely that this top portion is what went into the neck in this theory. And then they show the necklace again. Yeah, this, this top edge here. Now, a lot of people are pointing out this. It looks like this is damaged on this side. It looks like a piece of that cross maybe broke off and was put back on. Or maybe if there's, I can't tell if there's like little diamonds or something here, but it looks like they're missing from this other side. So could it have possibly been that piece that penetrated? I don't know. To better see the acceleration sources, notice how the necklace wraps increasingly tighter around the circle with the length of the free part decreasing. So this would be Charlie's neck. And this would be the pendant and necklace hanging down. So as cavitation happens of the neck, the forces on the outside of the chain would increase, pulling this closer and faster into the tissue. Here's the calculation for concrete numbers for a smaller and faster cavitation and neck and necklace links close to Charlie's. They're saying if anyone sees errors or is able to improve the formulas better, then let them know. There are vastly better mathematicians out there than I am, that's for sure. And then they kind of walk us through it. The neck expands, the pendant P moves up. So here's the neck. Neck is expanding. The pendant P starts moving towards the body. The parts of the necklace close to the neck wrap around the neck. So these parts here, that'd be L2s, are going to get closer and closer to the neck as the neck expands out. So I won't get super deep into the math here, but you can see it. You can screenshot it and test it out if you need to. But basically, they're estimating that it was about two two and a half milliseconds duration for the expansion phase. That's for the cavitation of the neck. They estimate 57 centimeter necklace length and then 40 centimeter neck circumference. So that would leave 12.7 centimeter neck diameter. So distance traveled along about eight centimeters. Velocity, 32 meters per second. Strengthened by the whipping effect, given by the ratio of the L2 before and after cavitation. In other words, how much it shortened within that period, about 59 meters per second. Now, he was saying earlier, he or she was saying earlier, that it would take 40 to 50 meters per second to pierce human flesh or to pierce the neck. Based on the estimation of the distance traveled and the cavitation, it happening within two and a half milliseconds, and then the whipping effect that adds to that from the chain would make it 59 meters per second, would make it 59 meters per second in their estimation. Then there was a comment from you guys. Why doesn't it happen all the time to people who were shot in the neck while wearing a necklace with a pendant? And Kali Kukul says, I think it might be because rarely the bullet travels vertically, making the neck cavitation in the horizontal plane to the side so efficient and prominent. So in other words, in a lot of cases, the bullet's going straight in 
and cavitation goes perpendicular. So if the bullet goes in here, the expansion is going to be up and down, right? So it's going to go up into the brain and down into the body. In this case, in this theory from Kali Kukul and also uh, Jason Goodman, if there was a shot from the back, is that the bullet hit the occipital lobe and went down the spine. And that vertical downward motion would cause horizontal expansion of the neck. So basically what they're saying is it's rare for a bullet to go down the body as opposed to into the body. All right, then we have some more. Kali Kukul says the whipping effect. Because people are going to say, well, why would the chain be whipping around? A whip is thick at the handle and gets thinner throughout its length. You swing the grip, slow movement of a heavy mass, and as that energy gets passed over to lighter and lighter parts of the whip, it has to move faster and faster for the momentum to stay the same. Momentum equals weight times velocity. So thanks to that, the speed at the end of a whip can reach up to twice the speed of sound. And then Kali Kugel comes back. I apologize, I found some numerical errors in my original calculation. And then Kali Kugel comes back. Same information, expanding circle, whipping effect. But they say, using the calculations below for, I believe, realistic parameters, neck size, cavitation, and duration, necklace length, I've come to the possible final velocity of the pendant of 45 meters per second, which equals 148 feet per second. And remember, it takes 40 to 50 meters per second to break the skin. So I would say it's in the ballpark of being possible, and it might not be correct to discard it as absolutely impossible. The above range is certainly approximate, and I wouldn't say anything just under 40 meters per second cannot pierce the skin, nay more. The calculations and chosen parameters might, of course, be a little bit different than reality, affecting the results in both directions, lowering or increasing the velocity. For instance, if the necklace was slightly longer, it would decrease the velocity. If it was slightly shorter, it would increase it. Shortening the necklace would increase the speed quite rapidly. So here's the new math. Go ahead and screenshot this and test it out. Same here. Screenshot that. Test it out. And the final. Test that out. So they landed on distance traveled of about 6.85 centimeters and a velocity of about 27.4 meters per second. That is from the cavitation. And then that's strengthened by the whipping effect given by the ratio after cavitation, how much the chain shortened during that period. And that came to about 45 meters per second, which is within the 40 to 50 that is said that is needed to pierce flesh. All right, so there you go. For everyone that wanted to see Kyla Kugel's response to if it could actually pierce the skin or not. Um, another possibility is maybe it didn't actually fully penetrate. It just had to nick it, right? All it has to do is, is cut open the surface of that vein, and it's going to burst open with all the pressure. So let me know your thoughts. Is this still plausible? I know some of you were saying that everything else about the theory kind of combined with the Jason Goodman shot from the back made sense to you. Does this make even more sense based on some of this math and other things that 40 to 50 meters per second is what it takes to kind of break open the skin or to pierce the skin. And Kali Kukul estimates it around 45 or so meters per second. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this around. And make sure you're getting some fresh air. Don't just sit and watch Charlie Kirk videos all day. I'll see you on the next one.